Okay, so we are recording now, and we have Ben Weselowski, I hope I got that right, talking on discrete logarithms in quasi-polynomial time in finite fields of small characteristic. And Ben, if you can just say one to two minutes about yourself, and then go ahead and, and dive right in. Sure. So um, I'm uh, Benjamin Weselowski. Uh, at the moment, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the CWI in Amsterdam, and I've been working on mathematical cryptanalysis. And uh, this particular result is uh, on proving that you can compute uh, discrete logarithms in quasi-polynomial time in certain finite fields. So in which finite fields? And uh, wait, okay. And why, uh, why, what is there to prove and what was known before? So I'm gonna start by saying a few words about the rigorous and heuristic algorithms we've known to solve this problem. Um, so the problem we're interested in is the discrete logarithm problem, as I said, in finite fields of fixed characteristics. So you're looking at fields of the form fp to the n, p to the n elements, where p is a prime number. And uh, fixed characteristic means that you look at the family fp to the n where p is fixed and n grows uh, to infinity. Think, for instance, the uh, binary fields uh, f2 to the n. And the discrete logarithm problem is uh, the following. You're given a generator g for the multiplicative group of the finite field and uh, an arbitrary element h in, um, in, that, uh, in that multiplicative group. And the task is to find an integer m such that h is g to the m. So express a given h as the power of the generator g. Um, this uh, problem was uh, shown to be solvable in sub-exponential time by Pomerance in 1987. So he proved that you can solve it with a uh, complexity L of 1 half, where uh, L of 1 half is using this classic notation for complexity, sub-exponential complexities. So L of alpha is uh, this quantity, which you should understand as being uh, faster than exponential in the length of the input, but slower than polynomial in the length of the input. So it's more efficient than um, supposedly a very hard problem that would be solvable in exponential time, but it's still slow enough to solve that you can rely on its difficulty to build cryptography. But we proved that we can actually do it in uh, um, much less time, actually in quasi-polynomial time. So quasi-polynomial is the second quantity that I write there, so exponential in uh, the uh, power of the log of the size of the input. So uh, here the little c that I write, if c is one, then it's just a polynomial quantity. And when I will say quasi-polynomial during this talk, I mean for c equals two. So it's slower than polynomial. Um, I mean, the algorithm is slower than a polynomial time algorithm, but it's much faster than L of alpha for any positive alpha. So uh, there's a, a big gap between L of one half and quasi-polynomial, but there's actually a lot that happened uh, between Pomerance's work and uh, what we are doing here. So here's a, big, uh, a quick uh, timeline, starting with maybe the, the prehistory of the discrete logarithm problem. It has interested people for a very long time, and Krejcik in 1922 already studied how to compute discrete logarithms in finite fields. And he didn't really have an algorithm at the time, but we have notes of him where he's actually computing by hand some discrete logarithms. And the methods that we see him using in his notes resemble a lot to what we're doing today, or what we call index calculus algorithms. So he didn't really have an algorithm, no complexities, but the methods are there. Um, then his work was not completely forgotten, although it wasn't, there wasn't much happening at the time, but uh, still in 68, Miller and Western, go back to his work, try to formalize it a bit, make it an algorithm, but they still don't have a complexity. But at the time, um, you, uh, you still don't have public key cryptography, so there is no real motivation in studying the discrete logarithm. That's uh, until 76 with uh, the work of Diffie and Hellman, where uh, finally the difficulty of computing discrete logarithms become very, becomes very important and the security of protocols relies on it. Um, but in uh, the work of Diffie and Hellman, the, they say that the best known algorithms to solve the discrete logarithm problem in a group of size uh, Q, big Q, is um, about square root of Q. So square root of the size of the group that's exponential in the binary length of the input. Um, 
but these algorithms, so I put it in a green here in the timeline because they are provable, but uh, they already suspect that there is possibly better that can be done in finite field. These algorithms, they are generic. They work in arbitrary groups, but in finite fields, you have these maybe works by Miller and Western that potentially could do better. So there's a question on where does the dependence on P come from? Um, so, okay, um, here we are working in fixed characteristic, which means that we treat P as a constant. You should think P equals two, and the complexities will, will be with respect to the degree of the extension of the field. So you work in uh, F2 to the N, and the complexity will depend on N. So that's uh, Diffian Harman in 76. So from that point, people uh, rush in and want to study the discrete logarithm problem much more seriously than it has been studied before. And Adolman does that in 79 by uh, taking all the previous work by Miller, Western, Krejcik, and making it into a real algorithm and analyzing it. So for the first time, we have an analysis of algorithms that are faster than exponential time. And uh, he says that there is an algorithm of uh, complexity L of one half in large characteristic. So I put it in gray here because it's not really the problem we're looking at. We're looking at the problem in small characteristic and he's giving his complexity in large characteristic. Large characteristic means that you look at the families, at the family of fields FP, where P is prime and uh, grows. Um, but we don't have to wait so much longer for uh, work to be done in small characteristic and Hellman and Rainieri do essentially the same as Adelman did, but for small characteristic finite fields and uh, show that you have a heuristic algorithm of complexity of one half. I put it in red here because it's heuristic. It's not proven that it can be done in time L of one half at, at the time. We don't have to wait much longer for uh, better algorithms to be discovered and Copper Smith only two years after show that there is a heuristic algorithm of complexity L of one third, so even faster than uh, L of one half, but still heuristic. And the first uh, provable result is the one I already mentioned by Paul Morenz, where he proved that you can actually compute all these, uh, these uh, discrete logarithms in time L of one half. So what's interesting to see here is that, so Paul Morenz is proving the complexity L of one half at a time where he already suspects that it's not optimal because Coppersmith already claims that maybe you can do L of one third. But well, L of one half is the best we can do at the time and it's the best we can do for a pretty long time. Not much happens uh, for a while. Um, actually, a lot of things happen, but this situation where the best rigorous algorithm is L of one half and the best heuristic one is L of one third doesn't change. So all the, all the advances in the area are, are mostly um, practical, improving the hidden constants in the big O's, getting the algorithms to actually run faster in practice. But then, um, big surprise in 2013, Antoine Zhu uh, devises an algorithm that runs in heuristic time L of one fourth. So that's uh, nearly, uh, nearly 30 years after the, the previous heuristic uh, improvement. So that came as a big surprise, but the biggest surprise came just a bit later the same year, where uh, Barbulescu, Godrijou, and Tomé reuse pretty much the same idea that Zhu introduced, but to show that you have a heuristic quasi-polynomial time algorithm. So still heuristic. And a year later, uh, Granger, Klein, Jung, and Sumrigel and devise another algorithm, also quasi-polynomial time, also heuristic, but bringing in new ideas. And uh, finally, uh, this year, we uh, proved that we can actually reach the quasi-polynomial complexity. And uh, this work, uh, where we prove that we can reach quasi-polynomial complexity, uh, is mostly inspired by the 2014 work by Granger, Klein, and Sumbrigel, and by the work of Pomerus. So I'm going to say first a few words about the work of Pomerus. How did he prove that you can uh, you can compute discrete logarithms in time L of one half. And uh, you've, it's not very easy to design an index calculus algorithm that you can rigorously analyze. It's, uh, very, these are a very tricky family of, uh, of algorithms. So how do they look? An index calculus algorithm is uh, of the following form. So first you have to fix a way to represent the elements in your field. You're gonna to want to compute 
uh, logarithms of elements in your fields, you first need to find a way to represent them as uh, binary strings. A classic way to represent these elements in your fields is to see uh, them as uh, polynomials, modulo and irreducible polynomials. So you represent fp to the power n as the polynomial ring over fp, quotiented by an irreducible polynomial j of degree n. And the polynomials mod j are the elements of, of the finite field. We are also given a generator g of your multiplicative group. And uh, now, to build an index calculus algorithm, you have to choose what we call a factor base. Factor base is a subset of your uh, finite field that will serve as uh, building blocks, so a small set of elements that will serve as building blocks to represent all the other elements. And typically, when we work in small characteristics and we represent the elements as polynomials, the factor base will consist in all the polynomials of small degree. So you fix a bound B and you say my factor base is the elements in the finite field represented by polynomials F of degree smaller than that bound B. You might also restrict to monic and irreducible polynomials and you also throw in the generator G into this factor base just for good measure. So G, the generator might not be a small degree element, but you can just throw it into the factor base and it's gonna be useful later. So now the index calculus algorithm is a, a three steps algorithm. Uh, the first step is what we call a relation collection phase. Um, and it consists in collecting a lot of relations of the following form, uh, sums of, well, linear sums of uh, logarithms of factor base elements equal to something. So you find the coefficients EF and you find the results R and you generate a lot of relations of this form for a, uh, well, a random, uh, well, you, you want them to be random. So these uh, relations hold to modulo the order of the group, which is p to the n minus one. Remember, it's the multiplicative group of the finite field. Um, so these are uh, relations between logarithms of factor base elements. These logarithms of factor base elements, you don't know them yet. Um, they, the factor base elements are small degree polynomials but it doesn't mean that computing their logarithms is easy. So they are, you can see them as unknowns. So you get uh, relations between variables, between unknowns, the logarithms of the factor base elements. If you collect enough, enough of these relations, uh, you obtain a linear system. And well, if you have enough relations, this linear system has a unique solution, which, is, which consists in all the logarithms of the factor base elements. So, if you uh, run the re relation collection phase for, sufficiently, for a sufficiently long time, you obtain a full rank linear system, you solve it, and you recover the logarithms of factor base elements. So at this point, you have all the logarithms of everything in your factor base, and you can go into the last phase, which is the individual logarithm phase. In this phase, you're given uh, the target element h, and you want to compute the logarithm of h. And the way you're typically going to do that is by uh, expressing the uh, h as a product of factor base elements and that will give you the logarithm of h as a linear combination of the logarithm of factor base elements which you now know okay so um how do you how do you uh, create uh, an index calculus algorithm where well, there is there is an ingredient for that that you can use which is a descent algorithm if you can uh, create a, an efficient descent algorithm, then you can create an efficient index calculus algorithm. So a descent algorithm uh, does the following. It takes as input an element in the field, an element H in the field, and rewrites H as a product of factor base elements. So it finds integers EF such that H is the product of uh, F to the power EF for all the factor base elements. So it rewrites arbitrary elements in terms of factor base elements. And if you have a descent algorithm, then you can uh, collect relations. A very simple way to collect relations would be to generate a uniformly random integer r between one and p to the n minus one. Then r is uh, obviously the logarithm of g to the r, but the logarithm of g to the r is the same as the logarithm of the descent of g to the r. The descent of G to the R is uh, a product of factor base elements, so its logarithm is a linear combination of factor base elements. So you get that your uh, random R is equal to a linear combination of logarithms of factor base elements. 
So by generating random integers R and using your defense algorithm, you can generate a lot of relations of the sort. Yeah, so if you have a descent algorithm, you have a relation collection algorithm. Now you also have an individual logarithm algorithm, because if you're given an arbitrary element H, the logarithm of H is the same as the logarithm of the descent of H, which is a linear combination of factor-based elements. Okay, so uh, now remains the linear algebra step. Uh, given a descent, you can do the relation collection and the individual logarithm, but to uh, do the linear algebra step, step you need to make sure that you can collect enough relations to form uh, a full rank linear system. And um, this is uh, usually a very tricky part of the algorithm because you want to generate relations that are random and uh, typically you're gonna say, okay, I designed a relation collection phase that generates random looking relations, but analyzing the probability distribution is too hard, so I'm just gonna estimate random, uh, uniformly random, and then say, uh, since I have uniformly random uh, relations, I will get a full rank system with good probability. But if you want a provable algorithm, not something heuristic, you cannot just say something hand wavy that uh, maybe the relations you generate are, are, are uniformly distributed. You need to actually prove that you get a good enough random distribution on your relations. And this is what Pomerantz uh, does. I'm not going to give the details, but essentially he proves a linear algebra slash probability lemma that says that given sufficiently many random vectors of a suitable form in a vector space, then you obtain a full rank system with, over, with a high probability. And he proves that the relation collection uh, phase actually has this, uh, this uh, suitable disparity of generating vectors of a suitable form. So there's a question saying uh, log h is the same as the log of the descent of h except for a constant factor. Um, so the, the constant factor uh, would be, um, if I can go back, okay. So here you have an actual equality between the elements. So it's not up to a constant factor. Um, maybe the what's causing uh, trouble here is that I said that in my factor base all the polynomials are monic. So you would need to have a constant here. By constant, I mean an element of SP, the base field. Um, and so to solve this problem, you need to have maybe all the, the elements in SP in your factor base. But SP is very small because we're working in small characteristics. So you have a constant number of new elements to add to your factor base. And then you have really an equality. So the equality between the logarithm of h and the logarithm of the descent of h is really an equality. It's not up to a constant. Uh, okay, so in summary, um, if we have an efficient descent algorithm, then we obtain an efficient algorithm for computing discrete algorithms because the descent gives you the relation collection and the individual logarithm step, and Pomerantz's lemma tell you that the relation collection um, gives you a full rank system so you can also solve the linear algebra phase. So now you need an efficient descent and the way Pomerantz is doing it is uh, in the following way. So you're given an element H and you want to rewrite it as a product of elements in the factor base. So he's doing it by uh, choosing uh, a uniform uh, integer between one and P to the N minus one. Then the element H times uh, G to the power R is also uniform in the multiplicative group. And therefore, if you see it as a polynomial reduced modulo j, it is a uniformly random polynomial, different from zero, of degree uh, strictly smaller than n. n is the degree of the extension, so it's also the degree of uh, the polynomial j. Okay, so he generates a, random, a uniformly random integer r, he gets an element uh, that corresponds to a uniformly random polynomial of degree smaller than n. And now with uh, good probability, and good means that you can actually analyze it using some analytic methods and uh, compute this probability and see that it's good enough. Uh, the polynomial that you get, reduced modulo j, will be b-smooth, meaning that it factors as a product of irreducible polynomials of degree at most b. In other words, is it factors as a product of factor-based elements. Um, and if you have that, then you can just uh, 
Okay, so what's, it, sorry, what's important here and that allows the uh, analysis to go through is that the polynomial you get is really uniformly random among all polynomials of degree smaller than n. This is what allows uh, the analysis because now you know how many uh, polynomials have degree smaller than n and you can compute how many of these polynomials are B smooth and therefore you can compute the probability that a uniformly random one is B smooth. So uh, once you have that, you can actually uh, have a, a relation between H and all these vector-based elements and taking the logarithm on both sides. Uh, sorry, you don't want to take the logarithm, you're just doing the descent here. You've rewritten H as a product of vector-based elements. And uh, the L of one half complexity comes from this uh, good probability. It will happen with probability one over L of one half. So you have to repeat this L of one half time. Okay, so in summary, um, Pomerantz proves that there is a descent of complexity L of one half and deduces that there is a, a discrete log algorithm of complexity L of one half. So there's a question, how large is B uh, for this claim? Well, uh, also L of one half. So you're gonna have a factor base of size L of one half. So it's gonna need uh, L of one half time, but also L of one half uh, uh, memory. Okay, um, so that's for uh, Pomerantz's algorithm of complexity of one half. Now we want to do better than that. We want an algorithm, we want a descent of quasi-polynomial complexity to obtain uh, the switch logarithm algorithm of quasi-polynomial complexity. And to do that, I'm going to talk about uh, the zigzag descent, which was introduced by uh, Granger, Klein, Jung, and Sumbrigel for their uh, heuristic quasi-polynomial time algorithm. So, um, in, it was in 2013 or 2014, Granger, Klein, Jung, and Sumbrigel uh, proposed a second heuristic quasi-polynomial time algorithm, and they actually proved the following theorem. So there's nothing heuristic in this theorem. They can prove it rigorously. They say that the discrete logarithm problem in fixed characteristic can be solved in expected quasi-polynomial time, at least for fields that admit a suitable representation. And suitable representation means that. It means uh, your field is of the form fq to the four uh, uh, square brackets x, the polynomials of fq to the four, quotiented by an irreducible polynomial j. Here, think of the four as the magic number. You just, you just need something here. And you want, so this so far is very classic. It's a polynomial ring quotiented by an irreducible polynomial. But you want an extra priority. You want that um, x to the power q is congruent to a small rational fraction modulo this irreducible polynomial j. So h to the power of q is h0 divided by h1 mod j, where h0 and h1 are both polynomials of degree at most two. So here you have uh, the Frobenius, and here you have a small rational fraction, and this is what will allow their algorithm to work. Uh, and if they have this representation, they prove that they can reach the complex this complexity here, which is a quasi-polynomial quantity when you uh, tune your parameters properly. So this they can prove rigorously, and then the heuristic part is about saying that you can always represent your field in such a way. Or if you're given a field, you can always find a very small extension of it that can be represented in such a way. And then you can solve the discrete algorithm in quasi-polynomial time. So uh, how do they do this? Uh, using, well, uh, the zigzag descent. The descent algorithm is uh, sufficient, as I already said. If you have a descent algorithm, then you have a full index calculus algorithm. And the thing they need to do is first fix the factor base. They are, they are going to fix the factor base as small as possible. So I said typically a factor base is a set of small degree polynomials. And here they take them as small as possible. So they take only the linear polynomials. The factor base is all the linear polynomials over this field uh, FQ to the four. FQ to the four, think about it as the, the base field. It's something very small. It's a polynomial size. You can enumerate all, it, all its elements. And you want to solve the discrete logarithm in a large extension of FQ to the four. So this factory base is very small, it's polynomial size. And then the descent would be an algorithm that takes an arbitrary polynomial over fq to the four and we write it as a product of linear polynomials over fq to the four. And the main ingredient to uh, do this descent that they introduce in, uh, in their work is uh, what we call the degree two to one elimination. The degree two to one elimination looks very much like a descent. It takes uh, 
a larger degree polynomial and we write it as a product of smaller degree polynomials. Except it's only taking as input degree two polynomials and we write them as a product of linear polynomials. Uh, just like that, it's not powerful enough. You cannot take something that we write degree two and turn it into an algorithm that we write arbitrary degrees. But you add some flexibility to this by allowing uh, the degree two elimination to work over field extension. So the degree two elimination takes uh, degree two polynomials over an extension K of uh, FQ to the four, and we write it as a product of linear polynomials over the same extension. So uh, here's how they turn a degree two to one uh, elimination into a descent. It's uh, this exact descent, and it looks like that. First, uh, suppose we, are, we want to descend a polynomial of degree of power of two, an irreducible polynomial of degree of power of two, which I represent here. Uh, it's defined over the base field, FQ to the four. Now you want to apply the degree two elimination, but you need to, uh, the degree two elimination can only be applied to polynomials of degree two, not to polynomials of degree of power of two. But if it's irreducible and of degree of power of two, you can go to an extension of your base field and factor it. So if you go to an extension of degree two to the power e minus one, this polynomial of degree two to the power e factors as a product of quadratic polynomials. So now you get quadratic polynomials defined over an extension of your base field. And factoring polynomials can be done in polynomial time, so you can do this efficiently. Now you have degree two polynomials over an extension, uh, so you can apply the, the, the degree two elimination. And we write this degree two polynomial as a product of degree one polynomials. Uh, now you have expressed your polynomial as a product of linear polynomials, but you're not done yet because these linear polynomials are defined over an extension of the base field. For them to be in the, in the factor base, you want them to be defined over the base field of q to the four. And now it seems you're stuck because you have degree one things, so you cannot apply the degree two elimination anymore. But here you have a quadratic extension. So you take any of these degree one thing, you multiply them by their Galois conjugates of this extension, and that's, that means taking the norm, and you get a degree two polynomial over the quadratic subfield, yeah? So you take all your linear things over the very top field, and you take the norm to the quadratic subfield, and you get degree two polynomials there. Now you can apply the degree two elimination again. Then you take the norm again, and then the elimination again, etc., until you've reached the bottom, and you have only degree one polynomials defined over the base field. Yeah? Uh, okay, I hope it's all clear. So this uh, is how to turn a degree two elimination into a descent algorithm, at least when your input is a degree, a power of two polynomial that's irreducible. But in general, you're not going to give, to be given a polynomial that's of degree of power of two, right? You're going to be given an arbitrary degree polynomial and you're gonna have to do a little a bit of work to get to a degree of power of two, but you, you can do that. So you're given a polynomial Q over FQ to the four of arbitrary degree. And uh, by picking random polynomials R of degree uh, two to the E minus uh, the degree of uh, J, so N, uh, you can look at the polynomial Q plus RJ and hope for it to be irreducible. And you pick a lot of random polynomials R until this Q plus RJ is irreducible. So why, why would you do that? Q plus RJ is now of degree two to the power E because RJ is of degree two to the power E and Q is of smaller degree. And uh, Q and Q plus RJ represent the same element in the finite field. They are congruent modulo J. So now you have represented Q as something that is irreducible and of degree two to the power E. So now you can go back to your descent and you start with an arbitrary degree polynomial. You write it as a degree to the power of Q irreducible and then you do the descent. Okay. So in summary, you have, uh, if you have a degree two to one elimination, then you get a descent algorithm via the zigzag descent, and then you get a full de in the discrete algorithm algorithm. Um, I cannot see the chat anymore.
Okay, if uh, the degree two thing is irreducible over the extension, you go to another extension to decompose it to degree one. Um, I'm not sure I get the question. So in the, if the degree two thing, I guess what is meant is uh, the the degree, the product of degree twos you get after factoring the degree the power of E. And then indeed you can uh, still factor it. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I got permission to pop in. So you you start with uh, some degree and you go to some extension where it decomposes to what to degree two factors yes so all right so how do you go from degree two to degree one because some some of those degree two things are so right they're irreducible over this last field so maybe I yes. didn't understand how you go from degree two to degree one when you have something irreducible already in the degree two. Oh, this is the degree two elimination. Uh, it, I didn't describe the algorithm yet. It's what the degree two to one elimination does. It takes and puts uh, a degree two thing, okay. Okay. and then we write it as a product of degree one thing. All right, so this but was it, a black box. It's not obvious. Box. Yeah, 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 it's a black yeah. box. Good, I'm, good. I'm going to open the black box and uh, show you how it works now. Okay, so uh, the, the, the message is uh, that you just have to design a degree two to one algorithm. You just have to see how this black, work, black box works and then you have a full algorithm. And uh, it works as follows. So here's the problem you're trying to solve. You fix an extension K of FQ to the four and uh, an irreducible quadratic polynomial Q over that extension. And the key idea of the degree two to one elimination is to observe that polynomials of this form alpha times x to the q plus one plus beta x to the q plus gamma x plus delta have a high probability to split over their field of definition k. By high, I mean uh, a random polynomial of this form has probability about one over q cube chance to split as a product of linear polynomials. This is uh, remarkably high because if you consider this as a polynomial of degree q plus one, a random polynomial of degree q plus one has probability about one over q plus one factorial to split as a product of, uh, of linear things. But if they have this particular form, instead of one over Q plus one factorial, which is a very small probability, you get only one over Q cube, and you can exploit that. But to exploit that, you can consider the vector space of all the polynomials of this form. So it's uh, uh, the four dimensional vector space of all linear combinations of the monomials one X, X to the Q and X to the Q plus one. So um, if you take an element in this vector space, and you use this uh, special relation x to the power q congruent to h0 divided by h1 that they uh, said we assume in the finite field, then you get the following formula. We get the, the formula following inequality, where on the, on, the, on the left you have the element of the finite field, of the, sorry, of the vector space, and on the right you have the rational fraction where the numerator is something of degree uh, at most uh, three. So on one side, you have something that splits as a product of linear things with high probability. And on the other side, you have something that is of degree three. And the denominator is H1, it's fixed. You just, uh, uh, you, it, it's not gonna cause any problem. So uh, we want to use this relation for our degree two elimination. So you want to eliminate a polynomial Q. So you can try to uh, involve Q in this relation. And you can do so by considering the vector subspace of V which I write VQ, of all polynomials where Q divides the numerator on the right-hand side. So uh, Q dividing the numerator is a linear condition. So you really get a linear subspace VQ and it actually has dimension two. And uh, what happens now if you take an element F in a VQ, multiplying H1 on both sides, you get that H1 times F is this degree three thing. And since F is in VQ, you know that Q divides the degree three thing. So I write the quotient L zero, it's a linear polynomial. Now we get that H one times F is a linear polynomial multiplied by Q. And in the event that F splits 
uh, into uh, linear factors, which I said should happen with, with good probability. So F is the product L1 up to L2 plus one. You get that Q is congruent to H1 times L0 inverse times all these linear polynomials. And then you're done. This is your degree two elimination. Uh, the algorithm would simply consist in picking, picking random polynomials F in the vector space VQ until uh, one of these splits over K. And then you get uh, this, uh, this relation Q congruent to a product of linear things. And uh, so I'm cheating a little bit here because not everything is linear. You have H1, which is of degree two, but H1 is fixed. So you can just put it in the factor base and it's not gonna cause trouble anymore. So instead of really a degree two to one elimination, you're reducing to uh, degree one things plus maybe H1. Okay, so that's the algorithm. And uh, we are mostly done, actually. We have the algorithm. We have the heuristic quasi-polynomial time algorithm, uh, assuming that we have the suitable model for the finite field, this model where x to the power of q is the same as h0 divided by h1 for a small degree h0 and h1. And this is what was done in uh, the, the, the article by Granger, Klein, and Sombrigal. Now we need to... It seems we need to prove that you always have a good representation for your finite field. You always have a, a way to represent your finite field where x to the q is a zero divided by h1. It turns out we, we cannot do that, or at least we don't know how to do that. People have tried very hard and it seems, um, it seems infeasible. We, can, we cannot prove that any field can be represented in that way. But what we can do is find other good field representations and try to make a descent that works there. And we're going to get good field representations uh, using uh, elliptic curves. So uh, here's the heuristic uh, finite field model that was used and that I just uh, used in the four uh, polynomials of refuge to the four questions by an irreducible polynomial. And the good probability about these field, this field, this field, the thing that you want to hold there is that x to the power of q is h divided by, divided by h1. In other words, the Frobenius is congruent to something of small degree. This is the priority you want. The bad thing about this field, of course, is that you cannot, uh, you cannot prove that you always have such a model. So you can try to do something very similar where the Frobenius is the same as something of small degree. And we're going to try to do this with elliptic curves. Um, so elliptic curves, uh, those of you who are doing cryptography, I'm pretty sure you've seen some already. Here's a representation of a, an elliptic curve over the real numbers. So uh, you can think of elliptic curves as a set of solutions of an equation of the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And uh, what we're actually interested in are not elliptic curves over the real numbers, but elliptic curves of the finite field. Um, so let's see if I can see that question. Okay. So um, we want to construct an, a model for the finite field FQ to the N, where uh, the Q Frobenius is congruent to some small rational map. So to do so, suppose you are given an elliptic curve defined over FQ. FQ is the base field, think, think of it as something very small. And uh, you suppose also that on your elliptic curve, you have a point Q of order N. Now, if you have such an elliptic curve and such a point Q, you can prove that you always have on the elliptic curve a point S, such that the Q for being used applied to S, the, this means that uh, you take your point S and you raise each coordinate to the power Q. Then you get the same point as S plus Q, so using the elliptic curve addition law. So you can prove that you always have a point S with this priority. And if you have this priority, then you can try to see what's happening to uh, S, uh, where each coordinate is raised to the power Q to the I. So the Q to the I is for Benius. Well, uh, S, uh, where each coordinate is raised to the power Q to the I is the same as raising everything to the power Q to the I minus one and adding Q using the priority of S. And a simple induction, you continue like this, you get that uh, it's actually the same as S plus IQ. So applying the Q to the I for Benius to S, gets you S plus IQ. Now Q is of order N. So these IQs, they are different from zero for any I strictly smaller than N. So the Q to the I for being applied to S is different from S 
20 i smaller than n. But now when i is equal to n, iq is zero. So the q to the nth Frobenius of i to s is equal to s. So s is a fixed point for the q to the nth Frobenius. It means that, q, uh, that the s is defined, is the, the field of definition, uh, sorry, the field of definition of s is uh, fq to the n. Um, I'm not sure if that's clear, but what that means uh, in more maybe rigorous terms is that fq to the n is the residue field of the point s over fq. So it's the field over which the coefficients of s are defined. And uh, so, yeah, the residue fields can be essentially defined as the field where the, co the, the, the coefficients live. And a more maybe useful way to define it is uh, in the following way. Uh, we need to work in the coordinate ring of the elliptic curve which is the following ring. I write it fq square brackets e. This is essentially uh, the polynomials over fq, except um, polynomials in two variables quotiented by the elliptic curve equation. So this is what we call the coordinate ring of e. So they are uh, rational functions, well, uh, polynomials that take values on the, uh, on the points of the elliptic curve. And now the residue field of a point S is uh, a quotient of this ring uh, for the following uh, equivalence relation. So two polynomials F and G are equivalent if they have the same value at the point S. So these uh, polynomials F and G, if you see them in the coordinate ring, you can evaluate them at points on the elliptic curve. A point on the elliptic curve has two coordinates say the first one is x, the second one is y, so you can evaluate polynomials at points. And um, you say that two of them are the same in the residue field of, the, of s if they are the same evaluated at s. So what do we do with that? Um, remember when we were trying to find a way to represent a field where applying the Frobenius is the same as a small degree map? So applying the Frobenius to the elliptic curve is this map that I write phi q that sends a point p to the same point where all the coordinates are raised to the power q. And you also have a translation map, which are small degree maps. They are going to be our h0, h1 things. So the translation by r, I write it uh, tau r, since p to p plus r. And now we get that for any uh, polynomial f in the residue field, f composed with the Frobenius is equivalent to f composed with the translation by q. And uh, there's, a, there's a very simple proof of that, because Two polynomials are equivalent if they are the same when evaluated at s. So you just have to evaluate them at s. f composed of the Frobenius at s is the same as f uh, applied uh, to the Frobenius to, to s uh, to the q. But by construction of s, this is just s plus q. So it's f translated by q of s. OK, so we have that these two uh, things are equivalent. And this is actually uh, the relation of the form Frobenius equals a small degree thing. You have Frobenius equals translation by Q. And this is the relation we're going to uh, build our uh, uh, elimination algorithms on. So now we want to solve the discrete algorithm problem in SP to the N. And um, we can find a model for SP to the N, assuming you have an elliptic curve E over SQ together with a point of order N. And then you have this special relation that Frobenius is the same as translation by Q, and you can make a descent that works. But can you always find an elliptic curve E at a point of order N? Um, well, almost always. So, so there is this theorem of Waterhouse that I'm not going to detail, but it essentially tells you that when N squared is smaller than two times the square root of Q, then there exists an elliptic curve defined over SQ that contains a point of order N. Um, and when it exists, you can find it very efficiently uh, because FQ is a very small field. So you can even enumerate all the possible elliptic curves over that field and find the one that has a point of order n. So when n squared is smaller than two times the square root of q, you can find a good model for your field FQ to the n. You can find the elliptic curve and the point of order n on the curve. Uh, now we're trying to solve the discrete logarithm problem in a field uh, of the form FP to the n. It's not obvious that P and N satisfy this condition, but you can always go to a small extension. So replace P by uh, a small extension Q. And now you can solve the discrete logarithm problem in FQ to the N. 
uh, such that n squared is smaller than two times q uh, the square root of q. Okay. So uh, right, just what's missing is an explicit version of this uh, theorem, right? To actually find the curve uh, with this t, no? Or um, so you can you can enumerate all the possible elliptic curves defined over f q. So you don't need the the theorem to be more explicit than that. F q is um, is very small. It's polynomial size. You can enumerate all the elements, and the the elliptic curves over f q. Uh, well, they are just given by uh, a small equation where, with coefficients in FQ. So maybe you have two coefficients to choose. So you have Q squared possible elliptic curves. You can list them all and you can compute the number of points efficiently and you pick the one that has a point of order N. Oh, okay. So Q is not the field you're solving DLP. So no, you're, you're solving it in FQ to the power N. Right, and Q is much smaller. Okay, right. Yeah. Oh, like N squared. Okay, good. Uh, or into the fourth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. So now we have we have our uh, new model for the finite shield. We can prove that the model always exists, th thanks to what I just said. You have you just have to find an elliptic curve in a point of order N on the elliptic curve, and we know it always exists. But now that you've changed the model, even though you still have a relation of the form for Benius is something of small degree, you have to design new uh, eliminations. Because the el elimination I described didn't only use the fact that the Frobenius is, is something of small degree, it, it really used uh, the, the explicit model. You used that the small degree thing is A0 divided by H1. Now a small degree thing is translation by a point on the elliptic curve. It's not clear at all how, how that helps. Um, but okay, let's, um, I'm gonna try to give you a quick idea of how we do the descent now. Uh, for that, I need to work in the function field of the elliptic curve. So the function field is very close to the coordinate ring, except now, instead of looking at just polynomials in X and Y, I'm looking at fractions of polynomials in X and Y. So fractions where the numerator and the denominator are both polynomials of X and y, in X and Y. Now, if I'm given uh, an element F in this function field, um, I need a notion of degree for that thing. I want to eliminate them, and an elimination is from degree something to degree something else. So I need a notion of degree on these things. And um, the, a way to extend, these are not just polynomials anymore. So you need a new notion of degree. And the way to extend the notion of degree to these rational functions is to count how many solutions you have to the equation f of p equals zero. So your counting roots, and this works. This works for uh, for polynomials. The degree of a polynomial is just the number of roots. If you work in the algebraic closure, of course, and then you have to count the roots with probability of the multiplicity. So this is the way you generalize the notion of degree. But now something, some weird things happen. If you take x, x is an element in the function field. It looks like something very linear, but it has degree two because you have two points on the on the elliptic curve for which x is equal to zero. It would be these two points in the in this uh, real elliptic curve. Okay, so x is a rational function, but it has degree two. Okay, but let's we can still try to do the same thing. Um, to try to still work in the, this vector space of things that split with high probability. But now an element f in this vector space it will split into well linear factors, but linear means of the form x minus a for uh, for field elements a. But these things, although they look linear, they have degree two. So you cannot really hope for a degree two to degree one elimination because the elements you're gonna get at the end have degree two. But maybe you can hope for something of the form uh, a degree two, a degree three to degree two elimination. You still reduce the degree if you can do something like that. So you can try to do something like that. You take uh, D an element of degree three and try to eliminate it to degree two things. And you can try to do something very similar to what uh, we did previously. So you look at the space Y of all the functions in our vector space, such that uh, the polynomial we're trying to eliminate uh, divides this uh, small degree uh, uh, equivalent of the element trying to eliminate. So here uh, you just take an element in the, vec in the vector space V and you replace all the instances of X to the Q by X translated by the point Q. And you hope that D divides 
uh, this new uh, this new form. And if it's the case, uh, if d divides that, well, uh, you get you can take the the the, the, the quotient. And the numerator is something of degree four because x is of degree two and the largest degree term is a translation of x times x divided by something of degree three. So you should get something of degree four minus three is one. So uh, I, I'm lying a little bit here because you, you can't just so, um, uh, subtract degrees when you're dealing with rational functions, but essentially this is what's happening. So if this is what's happening and now you suppose that f splits as a product of linear things, you can rewrite uh, the polynomial d that we're trying to eliminate as this product of linear things. And now linear means of degree two, and the algorithm could be just that. Again, you pick random polynomials f and t that they split, and when they split, you rewrite d, which is of degree three, as a product of things of degree two. And that's, well, it could work, but it actually doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work because y is too small here. So I'm not going to give the details and go very uh, straight to the end, but essentially, if you define y like this, there's only one point in y. So you cannot pick elements at random in y. If you pick an element at random in y, uh, you're going to pick the same every time, so you cannot hope for a good probability of success. Uh, so what you need to do is add a new degree of freedom that allows you to pick random points in a smaller thing than y, and this is how we do it. So as I said, I'm not going to give the details. Um, and if you do all this, then at the end, you indeed get a degree three to degree two elimination. And the algorithm is very similar. You define a curve X, you pick random points in X. These random points will give you with a good probability an elimination uh, of, your, of, your, of your divisor, of your uh, polynomial. So now we have a degree two, three to degree two elimination, and we can prove it always works. Uh, the proof is not so easy, but uh, it's actually the, the, the most difficult part of the job, but assume we have it. So here, this was the situation before. You had a heuristic degree two to degree one elimination. Now uh, we replaced it by a rigorous degree three to degree two elimination. But degree three to degree two does not allow the zigzag descent. Uh, so we are stuck again, uh, it's not enough. But if you had instead a degree four to degree two elimination, then you would still have a zigzag descent. But we don't have a degree four to degree two elimination. What we have is three to two. But we can also uh, design a degree four to degree three elimination and using very similar methods to what I uh, showed to you. And we can also prove it works. Now you have degree four to degree three and then degree three to degree two. It gives you a degree four to degree two elimination by just composing the elimination. And then you're done. You have a full rigorous algorithm for computing discrete algorithms. Um, well, it remains to actually go through these proofs that the, the eliminations work. Uh, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to uh, say a few words about the questions that are still open. First, um, these are probabilistic algorithms. Um, the running time we get is probabilistic quasi polynomial time. And it's still open if you can solve this in deterministic quasi-polynomial time. Then of course, uh, we would hope for a polynomial time algorithm. So this sounds very difficult and it doesn't sound like the ideas we've had so far uh, are sufficient to go to polynomial time. But well, if you can solve these two questions, you solve the question, uh, is the small characteristic discrete log problem in P? And then finally, you can try to see if uh, any of these ideas have an impact in a uh, medium or large characteristic, for instance, uh, the family of fields Sp, where P is prime. And yeah, that, that concludes it. So there's a question I didn't see. How do I choose the K? So which K was that? For the elliptic curve. For the elliptic curve. The field extension, like the the last slide, you were, yeah, this one, fixed and extension. Here? Yeah. Oh, it's a uh, whichever field that you need your elimination to work on. Remember, in the zigzag descent, you go to extensions. This is the extension uh, k. It's just part of the input of your uh, descent algorithm. Is that clear? Yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Yeah. So, so this, 
Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, no, no, let, let's go. I, I, my mind was more a general question. Uh, okay, so I'll ask maybe. Uh, so this thing that it's uh, three, like three to two, it, it has to do with the degrees of the H1 and H0 that you get representing the Frobenius. Uh, what, what's your question? Why do I get three to two? Yeah, right. So you, you, you manage to represent x to the q as uh, h1 divided by h0. And uh, so I guess I'm asking, yeah. In, uh, yeah. In the first yeah. version of the algorithm. So, in in so this maybe, version, yeah. Um, well, I, I understood that uh, your, also your thing was uh, the elliptic curve stuff was to get such a representation. No? Yeah, or so in the elliptic curve case, you don't get an H0 and an H1. What we're aiming for is something to have instead of H0 divided by H1, that would also be a small degree rational map. The small degree rational map um, means, in our case, translation by a point. Uh, right, so that's like a, as a rational map, it has like what so I guess I'm asking what numerator and like what degrees does it have? Is, uh... Uh, yeah, so the explicit formulas are pretty ugly because this is addition by a point on elliptic curve. So this, the formulas for this rational map would be, um, would be the addition formula by Q. Right, so I'm saying it's right. It's probably a, a cubic degree in the in the, in the numerator. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, but, I guess but I'm... in a geometric sense, it has mm -hmm. even in a geometric sense it has degree one because it's a bijection. Yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm trying to understand if there's a relation between the fact that you get a three to two uh, thing because it is a rational function. The, this translation corresponds to, I'm guessing, something degree three in, in the numerator. And if there are like any lower bounds, like is it hypothetically possible that you can get, like what's the sort of lowest degree possible representation mm -hmm. you could get uh, for a general so, field? So, yeah, that, that's a very tricky question. And it comes to what's the degree? Here, we cannot get to degree lower than two because we are trying to decompose as a product of things of the form x plus or minus something. Uh, so that's uh, what I discuss here. So if, if you use this, these methods of using this vector space of uh, rational functions in x, what you get are linear functions in x which have degree two. So you, that's why you go to degree two. Um, and to go to degree one, well, it's unclear what that means because you would need uh, rational functions of degree one and there's no rational function of degree one because the degree of a rational function is how many uh, solutions, uh, well, the degree of F is how many solutions of, does F of P equals zero have and you always have at least two solutions on an elliptic curve. You cannot define, define a function that has only one solution. If you count with multiplicities, of course, you could have a line tangent. For instance, if you have a vertical line here, I don't know if you see my mouse. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Yeah, if you uh, have a vertical line here, it's gonna intersect your elliptic at only one point, but it's a tangent, so it's counted twice. So you only have degree two things. So if you're trying to do an elimination in two rational functions, then you're never gonna be able to go lower to degree two. Now you could work with devices instead of rational functions and try to get to degree one, but uh, we didn't get that to work. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, thanks. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm, 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 oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, ju just uh, what is the paper about discussion? I'm not sure I could uh, feel the gap. I, I didn't hear that very well. 
Yeah, your sound is a little low if you can speak pretty clearly into the mic. Sorry, yeah. Um, what is your paper um, bringing into this whole uh, evolution of algorithm? In which part are you, is your paper coming to place? Okay, so uh, my paper is the last one on this timeline. So what I spent a lot of time explaining is mostly the Granger, Kleinung, and Subrigal quasi-polynomial time algorithm that works in this heuristic uh, field representation. In this last work, we introduce the, the elliptic curve representation and the new uh, 4 to 3 and 3 to 2 descents that work in the elliptic curve representation and that get us the fully provable algorithm. So uh, in my presentation, anything after that point where I introduce the elliptic curve model is new in our article. So I'm a little right. You're saying x, right? X is like a, a function on this curve. It has degree two, but I'm confused. Do we care about that, or we do we care about the degree of x in this like field of this point s? Um, um so you do care about uh, the geometric meaning of degree because uh, you're going to do translations by points. You're going to translate by q, for instance. This is not going to present to preserve a nice shape of your polynomials. You don't want to work with the degree of how your polynomial looks like in terms of the degree of the highest monomial. Because uh, say here you're going to look at polynomials of the form x translated by q. This you cannot say it has degree one in x. It's not linear in x, it has, it's an ST addition formula. Oh, right. So, so you're saying in, in a sense your, your whole or a lot of your algorithm, I mean, it works over this field where you have the equivalence on S, but, but your, the representations you use for a lot of the algorithm are is elliptic curve uh, operations. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we cannot just work with polynomials in X. Um, here it appears we work with just polynomials in X, but by doing this translation by Q, you involve Y also. And you, well, you have ugly formulas for that. So you don't, yeah, you cannot just count the degree in X. That would be very tempting and saying, okay, instead of this geometric notion of degree, I just say, oh, this is of degree one because it looks like it's of degree one, but then you cannot make the algorithm work. So, I mean, I mean, can you say that this whole thing is sort of a, a generalization of the, the previous algorithm to, like it looks like you're in a sense you're you're doing a similar thing to the similar algorithm, but you're not exactly working in a field. You're you're working in this like ring of. So uh, we are working in a field, but the field has a very weird shape. The field is, uh, it's this thing here. It's the residue field. It's still a field, except it's not the usual polynomial ring quotiented by an irreducible polynomial. It's a coordinate ring quotiented by uh, an irreducible ideal in there. Uh, yeah, uh, right, but a big, comp well, I'll maybe I'll offline or later I'll, uh, I'm only sort of half understanding what, what I'm asking, so. Uh, okay, well, if, I, if I can get a, give a better answer. Um, Yeah, I guess I guess no, I need to I need to sort of digest and, and f formalize my thoughts in a more uh, co coherent way. Uh, for, uh, I think the good thing about un unanswered questions is they ensure future conversations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which which well, is totally. the, yeah. So um, which which I think is great and and is definitely one of the advantages of of having. Um, folks from the outside, especially folks doing some really exciting, uh, exciting work. Um, it, we're a little past the hour, which is fine. We, we have the normal attrition over the last 20 minutes of folks having to head off to other meetings. But uh, Ariel or David, if you have any other questions or Ben, if there's any sort of final thoughts you wanted to share, um, let's, let's do that. And After that, we'll just kind of end the recording.
Okay, so I'm going to end the recording, and uh, if there are any offline questions that come up, we can we can keep on with that. But uh, on the record, Ben, thank you for uh, taking your time to both prepare this and uh, share it with us. It's really really fantastic, and we'll be getting this up and sending you the link so that you can you can also share it with others. And I know a lot of other people in the in the PL community will be will be watching this over the next couple of weeks.